All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. Right here, if you have a beard, random men are going to always walk up to you and try to lick your beard. Ew, that's so <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're one of its kittens. Hold on, fuck. So I'm like, nope, 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 nope. Oh, well, you lost all your fleets. Oh, fuck. Not what we intended. Oh, God. What do we do? The Meta Show. What's up, everyone? Saturday again. Welcome back to the Meta Show. Today's special guest is going to be Sion Kimitomo, which he will be coming in later in the show. Uh, get back to our segment format as before. Uh, so this week, guys, we've actually had a, uh, a kind of slow week for EVE news in general, but a big week in CCP-related news, which we'll jump into uh, here in the CCP Police section. So the Matani, what's up? How, how's your week going? Uh, and I guess we'll jump straight into the Nullsec Power Hour if you don't have any shout-outs. What? I mean, you, you don't want to hear about my week? Is is that it? Are you just going to gloss over how my week went? I'm, I, I'm the, horn, the horny white boy I mean, lifestyle. Is that what we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to miss out on? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but I mean, if you guys want to hear it, that's <sighs> wallowing in pleasure like a horny white boy. Wow, I don't, oh, I don't even know. You yeah. can't make that shit up. But, uh, it, it, it is, uh, you know, we live in interesting times. No, it's been, it's been a good week all the way around. We've had, uh, you know, got back from Cancun, had a nice little vacation out there at uh, Goon Base One. I mean, we talked about that last week because we just got back from Cancun and then we went into the meta show the next day. Time becomes a blur when you're yachting. Uh, but, uh, oh, no, it's been an interesting week. Like, we yeah. got to see this new patch with EVE is fantastic. We have great news. Uh, people were loving the Command Destroyers. We're getting some action in Cloud Ring and low sec. Where by action, I mean mostly, uh, well, not so much anymore, but mostly getting our asses handed to us mm -hmm. on the Imperium side of things. Had a, lost a couple fights. We'll talk about those in a bit. Um, we've got scandals in EVE. Scandals. We've got the, the EOC rumble thing. We've got, uh... A lot of drama and uh, you know big news with Oculus Rift as well. So let's get stuck in. Where do we want to go first, Laz? Take us well, away. I mean, I think definitely should jump straight into the kind of the scandalous stuff. I think probably the biggest Eve-related news we've had this week would be the EOC Rumble charity stuff. Um, and then, of course, OBS decides to freeze up as we go into NullSec. There we go. Sweet. Sweet. It's working again. All right. So, guys, NullSec Power, I guess. EOC Rumble. Uh, I, I was reading articles about it late, earlier this week, and apparently the group that all the ISK was sent to, I believe, is... Oh, what's the name of it? No. Uh, I had it pulled up. It's like EOC TV or something. Well, right? EOC TV is the group that held it, but they weren't the ones that held the funds. Um, oh, yeah. okay. Let's see if I can pull this up one more time. Now, uh, now, from what I heard is that these guys were actually like using the funds that were supposed to go to the charity mm -hmm. as like startup capital to create a casino type right. thing. So it's Evil at Work was the name. Evil at Work was Evil the name of the group. Uh, and okay. yeah, so they, apparently they used the ISK from the charity to do, to run a startup for their casino, their EVE casino. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, hey, I mean, truth in advertising, right? If you have a charity <laughs> run by a group called Evil at Work, mm -hmm. then what do you expect is going to happen? I mean, what's what's the name of this, uh, you know, what's the name of their casino? Do we do we e have... EveCasino.net, uh, and it says it's coming winter 2015. So I don't know if that's going to be uh, put on hold or whatnot, but it's... Apparently, wow. it, yeah, I mean, like okay. e EveBet pledged some ISK, uh, and actually EveBet went into their pockets and donated ISK to the charity groups that were supposed to be getting the ISK in the first place. Uh, so so shout out to e uh, EveBet. Uh, I believe that's Bam Stroker and his crew. So that, that's some I, of a that, That's just really interesting to me because, I mean, we uh, that event was held within one jump of the Imperium staging system in Cloud Ring. And uh, it, it's funny about this particular scandal because we, of course, joined that event. Uh, we intervened. We shot things. Well, like every other single event like this that has ever happened before, you saw uh, Pandemic Legion has done that for a number of things, like the fi uh, Flight of a Thousand Rifters events mm. before. And, uh, of course, because we're awful people and everybody hates us, uh, the reaction was, how dare they, even though blocks always intervene in these events. And we were called, actually, the ISIS of EVE, because how dare we show up to a charity event? And because we showed up to the charity event and we donated, uh, you know, we sent pings across the entire Imperium to send a hundred million isk plus. Feel, you know, send whatever you can over there uh, to support this event. Uh, and you know, we were just mm -hmm. lambasted for it for how how dare we? Even though we were probably the single biggest donators. Yeah. Uh, and now it turns well, out that the whole thing was a scam. And uh, I don't, I don't really see torches and pitchforks about that. Mm -hmm. That's that's interesting. Where, where's the outrage? 
I well, ask you, where is the outrage? Well, it's exactly true. But like like Jamatin just said in chat, he said you can't make this shit up. Scamming from charity. Welcome to Eve. But typically with Eve, it's the exact opposite. Like if you if you think about Eve and it's like cutthroat uh, society, e Eve is the most giving community I know when it comes to charity and stuff like that. I mean, you have the GoFundMe recently for Photon Torpedo, which I think is up to sixty thousand dollars. It is. I, it I is. mean, it's it's crazy like eve is a great community for charity and giving to other people outside the community and it's a very mature community because if you look back whenever they did that study or whatever like the average age was like 32 33 for an eve mm -hmm. player so yeah. like this this is uncharacteristic for eve online uh, for a charity it, it is it is unusual i mean having a, a scam involving a charity uh, or you know somebody in chat is saying that it wasn't it wasn't a scam it was uh, just poorly communicated, but you know the way that it was presented. And if I remember correctly, this event was actually promoted on CCP's 07 show mm -hmm. as a thing that was going to happen. And so, uh, you know, the right thing to do here, of course, is for CCP to intervene and make sure that the the ISK funding that was you know intended to go to the charity actually mm -hmm. gets to Plex for Good. And I believe the charity in question was Care for Kids. Uh, you know that you know people are donating that. Uh, we need to make sure the the reason why this is different when we're talking about a charity that's going to something out of game is if it is okay to scam for charity, uh, especially if it's an event that's promoted across the entire community and is highlighted by CCP, um, it risks all of the other future charities, right? It makes it a risk for us all to come together to do some good outside of New Eden because now people, unless that there, unless there is stern action about this to secure that ISK and make sure that it actually gets the charity from CCP, uh, you know, it makes us worry um, whenever we're going to do future charity events. Like, is this actually going to be legit or is it just going to be, ha, 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 that's Eve? And I don't think we want to cross that line. Oh, and Porkbutt actually brings up in chat, uh, one, they said they'd take care of the Titans. Two, Titans weren't taken care of. Three, Titans died. <laughs> Four, money money raised isn't enough to cover the Titan deaths or give to Plex for good. Wow. Oh, so I, I thought those Titans were going to be donated. I, did, I didn't actually like look completely into it, but I thought the Titans were going to be donated to the actual event and that they weren't being reimbursed. So apparently the Titans died and they're supposed to be paid for? That is dumb as all hell. Yeah. Like, whatever the truth is here, what we do know is, is that there is money that people donated to go to a real-world charity for a good cause. One of many charity events that our community, you know, the community of Eve as a whole, mm -hmm. of course, there's a whole joke to be made about Scion's article that he said about community is that pissed a bunch of people off. But in general, you can say that there is a player base as a whole that is then donating money to a charity, and that needs to be protected, right? That mm -hmm. needs to be something that we are serious about. Um, and, you know, whatever their excuses are, like, oh, well, we had to reimburse the Titans, this, that, or the other thing, and so we couldn't actually give anything to charity, uh, is just, you know, shameful excuses. Um, well, they, they, the Titans weren't paid for, like, they didn't actually comp the Titans like they were supposed to, so, like, literally no one got any ISK. Like, Evil at Work has the ISK, and it's, yeah. Well, I mean, whatever, that's just dumb as all hell. But again, mm -hmm. I'll ask you, where is the outrage? Like, this is something that is a legitimate scandal that people donated for charity and then that was either defrauded or miscommunicated or was a scam or what have you, uh, and you're not seeing torches and pitchforks in the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw torches and pitchforks about the Imperium showing up for the event, participating in the event, and then donating to the event. Mm -hmm. But you don't see nearly as much outrage about uh, the charity itself being a scam. And that is yeah. just hilariously hypocritical. And if you are not upset about this and you are not condemning it, uh, but you condemned the Imperium getting involved in the event, mm -hmm. then uh, if you're listening and that's your view, then you're a hypocrite and you should feel bad. Yeah. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Awesome. <laughs> let's uh, let's Exciting. move on. Yeah. Oh, so guys, uh, so lately, I guess the big the big news when it comes to fights in Nullsec and Eve Online period, uh, there's a lot of small skirmishes happening around, uh, and small being hundred versus hundred, hundred versus two hundred. I mean, like it, it's not your typical massive five hundred versus five hundred, blah blah blah. You should see in Eve Online, but. Uh, Recently, the last past week, he had a 400-person brawl between us, between dead terrorists and Shadow Cartel and uh, Imperium, as well as uh, some other low-sec forces, uh, where they actually killed, or the entire battle, 70 billion is lost, which is kind of a big number these days, uh, which is kind of sad. But <laughs> sad lads, sad lads in snow. You can see him pouting. His, his, the, the beard I mean, droops. <laughs> It's like it's, a puppy, sad well, puppy. I mean, I mean, seventy billion isn't even a single titan. It's 
Like, like a build cost for a single Titan is 79 bill. So so for a fight, does 70 bill? And, uh. Well, I mean, the thing about this, and, and like, I found low sec to be pretty interesting because like the, the big thing that is new for us in the Imperium is that, uh, you know, we have been going to low sec because it's a territory that we've historically been sort of bad at. And the first couple of weeks we were there, we had some victories. There were, again, minor skirmishes and things like that against forces like Snuffbox. And uh, then we, I was wondering, because like we really should be just getting our asses hand to, uh, handed to us, right? Like you learn through failure. You yeah. fail, you pick yourself off the floor, you say, why did I fail? You take ownership of the failure, and then you adjust and you move forward, right? Mm -hmm. So I was hoping that we would get our asses kicked a few weeks back, but it wasn't really until like this last week that we just started losing, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, Stuffbox did a great job of uh, murdering a couple of our Proteus fleets, uh, and then our skirmish commanders sort of adapted, started using hurricanes. We've changed a whole bunch of our doctrines, and it's been really interesting trying to take uh, the sort of null sec command and control fighting style going into you know Black Rise and fighting these you know extremely highly skilled uh, you know all credit to Stuffbox like the the things that they do on on in their group with swapping out mods mid fight using nesters to adjust their macarials to always be able to in hope mm -hmm. of always being able to counter us um, you know it's a really challenging and interesting and different sort of gameplay. Um, and I'm looking forward to building a throne out of dead Macarial Rex, and so we're gonna, we're, we're gonna keep at that. But that's what do you think is the the most interesting thing about low sec combat as opposed to null sec combat, Les? Well, before getting to that, uh, Donald Trump is apparently tuned back into the stream, and uh, <gasps> Donald Trump, yes, uh, oh my, is, is the nation just went off the screen too, and I missed it. My Bentley costs seventy billion dollars just to fill the tank. I spend more than seventy billion to fire people. P.S. You're fired. Well, thank you, Donald Trump, for supporting us. Ten dollars. Uh, supporting our, uh, you know, horny white boy lifestyle and uh, wallowing in pleasure and yachting geez. and all that other good stuff. Um, wow. Now, the, the, the interesting, uh, the, the, the interesting thing about the uh, about low sec compared to null sec as an FC is the use of the pirate implants. Like the fact that they're able to put in these mid grade and high grade slave sets to to boost their EHP on their materials, which a lot of them are going to be dead space fit anyways. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're looking at over four hundred thousand effective hit points per battleship. And already, battleships are the direct counter to Tech 3 fleets in general. So you have these huge, huge uh, mass, massive hit points where you can't just volley through them or, or try to trick the reps and get the reps stuck on one target and uh, quickly swap because they have so much EHP you can't cut through them quick enough. Mm -hmm. So it, it's been a huge, huge, I guess, uh, we're having to catch up, catch up to them uh, fleet meta wise because, because we're not used to fighting this way like it, it's different for us and it's actually going like any other null sec war we've ever been in where we we up we up for the start of the war and then we we so we adapt and we get into gear and then then we just steamroll everything's typically the way it goes but like we we, we lost a few fights adapted we've lost uh, another fight this week um and so now we just gotta get back into it and keep keep changing and that's that's what makes a good fc is anyone that can take a loss or even a win and see what can i do better what can i fix for next time it's been a, a huge opportunity. Like one of the things that we see with CCP focusing on adding more sand to the sandbox, and we'll get to that in a bit when we're talking about CCP please, where we have um, new command destroyers and things like that, which are awesome. Um, we have been adapting a lot. Like the Imperium has radically changed its doctrines in the last uh, just month as we get into low sec, right? So like uh, Fuck You Fleet, which was our E War cruiser fleet that we used as a standby for years, has now been shifted purely into frigates. Uh, just crucifiers and molluses. We have uh, a jackdaw doctrine. We just announced a rattlesnake doctrine. Uh, you know, in general, the, the sort of ships that we're flying are far more advanced. And I think that's because there hasn't been any real serious uh, null sex of warfare in a while. So low sec is our first opportunity to go. You know, we haven't touched that in two years. Maybe we should get with the times. And that's the part I love. We're flying I, I, I really our far enjoy, more... Uh, you know, basically getting dick punched uh, and having to go, okay, we lost, we suffered, mm -hmm. how do we fix this? And then you start to see our FCs beginning to, to win against uh, these Macario fleets, which we're not supposed to be able to beat. So that's a lot of fun. I've been I've been enjoying the hell out of it so far. Well, it's, it's the only group that's actually forming up to fight us in, in actual numbers lately. So it's, it's kind of a, a change of pace altogether. That is true, uh, and you know part of the part of the people forming up to fight us or not is uh, this is a subtle segue uh, into the announcement about the Dominion of Cloud Ring. So one of the things that we've talked about here is uh, you know the Viceroy program, the idea, the draft idea of us trying to uh, take regions 
in a way that does not actually involve holding sob. And this has never been done before, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which means it might fail, right? Like straight up, it might fail. Everything that we do when it is completely new no, has the beginning, a risk associated with it. You know, you have to test your ideas, you have to cycle through them and, mm -hmm. and learn and adapt. Um, but what we ended up doing this week is probably big news, uh, is we announced that all blue uh, to the Imperium assets within Cloud Ring, with the exception of the Asilo constellation, which is held by mm -hmm. SMA, uh, are to be evacuated. So no Corp moons, no Squad moons, no anybody has moons there, and we're basically creating a vacuum. Uh, and we don't know what's going to happen with that, that vacuum. The idea is is that some people will move in there and then we will either fight them uh, or they will accept our generous offers. And we, you know, we're basically just going to experiment with that. And so you're seeing we dropped SOV, whereby we, I mean SMA, uh, just the day or two ago, just dropped SOV in all of their territory in Cloud Ring. Uh, Pandemic Horde immediately went in and TCU'd it. Good for them. Mm -hmm. And then what we're going to have to do is see who holds what moons and how that works. And it'll probably take, you know, a month at least to between fighting in low sec and fighting in cloud ring to see whether this idea uh, actually has any legs. And so that's gonna be exciting. So question from chat regarding that, uh, and you mentioned Pandemic Horde taking back the uh, the Sav. Uh, as as are an Argent says, Mittens, are we going to have to reburn the Sav that Pandemic Horde took back? No, and that's one of the things that's uh, sort of interesting and confusing about the Dominion system, or at least our idea of a Dominion system, mm -hmm. is that we are interested in who holds the moons, particularly the R64s, Technetium, Cadmium, and Hafnium, right? And it doesn't matter within that territory who holds what's off, uh, because the only thing we're interested in is the products of the moon. Uh, and, you know, I think that's going to be interesting. If this system works, uh, I would not be surprised to see both Pandemic Legion and, uh, you know, the Russian soft holders begin implementing it in their territory. So um, it's an interesting test case. If we can pull it off, that means that any other block level entity that has the ability to project power locally um, should be able to set up dominions of their own. So we're, I think we're sort of seeing maybe the birth of a new political system here. Uh, is it a good one or a bad one? That's up for debate. Can it actually happen? I don't know. But if it does work, um, and it is a solveless thing, and it's purely interest in the moons, uh, then I think you're going to start seeing PL and death doing it like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. So uh, I guess shifting into more of uh, the what's going on with CCP uh, this week, uh, jump into our CCP police section, guys. Uh, the biggest news we've heard this week uh, regarding EVE Online period is going to be the, the recent virtual reality stuff that came out. Uh, and if you've been paying attention to any type of tech or gaming news at all, you saw that Oculus Rift is not going to be bundled with EVE Valkyrie. Like literally, if you buy Oculus Rift, you get a copy of EVE Valkyrie, which is kind of like giant for CCP. This is massive. And like this actually explains a lot of this is sort of like business stuff here. But this explains the recent investment of $30 million into CCP that we saw that was uh, visible in the business world uh, about a month ago. Because we now know why people would pump $30 million more million into CCP and their virtual reality programs because they probably knew in advance that it was going to be bundled with Oculus Rift. Uh, this is huge for EVE Online, not just for Valkyrie. Um, if the Oculus Rift takes off. Why? Uh, the game that is bundled with a new type of gaming system uh, mm -hmm. is essentially, it's like Super Mario Brothers, right? Like when the Nintendo Entertainment System, because now I'm showing my age here, came out when I was uh, a little kid or something, you got your NES, it came with like Duck Hunt and Super Mario Brothers. And for a while, all anybody was playing, because that was the only thing you really had, was Duck Hunt and Super Mario Brothers. Uh, and people are still talking about Super Mario Brothers today, all the time. It's a, it's a massive cultural phenomenon. Um, so if Oculus Rift takes off, the fact that E Valkyrie is likely to be the best of the games. Now, I don't know what the other bundled games are going to be. I don't know what the competition is. Mm -hmm. um, but if Rift goes big, that means that everyone who plays Rift will, you know, will know what Eve is, will know what CCP is, and a percentage, we don't know what that is, but a reasonable percentage of those people will begin to come back to New Eden, which is massive. I mean, I, I really hope that the Rift goes well. Uh, I, I think it will. Depends upon the price point. And we're saying Q1 of 2016. That's the first time we've actually had like a, a date certain. Well, it's not certain, technically, but Q1 2016 is a lot more uh, something that we can put a bank on rather than it's going to come out whenever. Uh, I don't know whether people in chat are excited about that, but uh, you know, from a business perspective, it's mm -hmm. going to be, I think, really good for, for New Eden. 
Well, having played Oculus Rift at the different Eve events that I've been to lately, uh, it's it's definitely come a long way from the first iteration, and it's 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 an amazing game. Like it, it's something like people are looking at like kind of like Oculus like esports for that type of game because it does have a good competitive mode to it, uh, which I'm really looking forward to personally as a competitive nerd, um, and. Like you said, bringing people to New Eden is always going to be the the ultimate goal uh, for us as Eve players, and hopefully it does go well. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the other thing that's interesting about virtual reality is, is that people talk about Valkyrie, they see trailers or things like that, but you really need to experience it, right? Like, mm -hmm. the thing about VR, particularly good VR, and Valk is just the best example of this, is my first virtual reality experience, and I tried Elite Dangerous uh, with Oculus Rift later, mm -hmm. But the first time you put it on and you actually get a chance to play it and you like look around and you're able to like look up and under your cockpit, mm -hmm. um, if you're of a particular generation who has always wanted like a holodeck or virtual reality or you grew up reading Snow Crash mm -hmm. or something like that, like this is, it's almost a religious experience, right? Like this is the future that early gaming nerds wanted and it's actually there. And so when you first strap into your cockpit and you're about to get launched out of the, the carrier, uh, catapult is it's just fantastic. So uh, I, I have big hopes for this. I hope it goes well. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the the challenge is it's in Oculus's court now, right? Like CCP has done everything they can. Getting Valkyrie bundled oh, with the Rift yeah. is so huge, and now the success or failure of Valkyrie and the success or failure of the entire enterprise is pretty much in Oculus's hands. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we wish them all the best. Yeah, it's going to be super, super exciting, and uh, hopefully, I, I think the biggest hurdle is going to be PC PC requirements. Is everything has to be, I think, uh, sixty FPS for mm -hmm. like, minimum for Oculus Rift. So, so guys, go ahead and start upgrading your, your your PCs for it. Do we know what the like? Have they announced the price point on this? Like, uh, the I consumer don't version of the think Rift? So I don't think so. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. I'm I'm not very like, like I'm not into the VR as, as much yet because I don't have anything that I can run it. Um, but it, it's definitely something exciting and new. I, I can't wait to see uh, to be able to stream from the Oculus Rift and like FPSs and stuff like that and in, in, in just the environment. That is going to be fantastic. Well, thank you, Vabina, for supporting and obeying HypnoKitten. And uh, let's move on. We have a lot of other news. We have uh, this is much more in uh, in Laz's court in terms mm -hmm. of FC expertise. But uh, you know, grid sizes have been expanded, which is kind of a big deal. We have command destroyers. Laz, what do you think is out of the the changes in this patch mm -hmm. with Logi frigates, command destroyers, and the huge expansion of grid sizes? What do you think is the most significant adjustment? Ah, uh, I'm probably the command destroyers. Like I, I've, I've like the entire week this week, I, I've ranted all my streams about the command stories about how how terrified actually I am of them. Just because it's just as an FC, it's it's going to completely change how you how you have to interpret a grid because uh, I, I, one of these things can land and just teleport half your fleet away, and, and you're just like, why, where, why is my fleet halfway this way, and how do I get back to them, or how, they're going to die? Uh, it's and if you look at Reddit or any of the other places that you see YouTube videos posted, there's been some hilarious shenanigans already going on with the uh, with command destroyers. Um, like the a lot of people in low sec will use off grid links on either gates or stations, and what you've seen is people actually going and teleporting these people off of these gates so they can't jump through and be safe, and they're teleporting them 100 kilometers off. Mm -hmm. um, and I will drop this link in chat actually of uh, of a group of Russ Russ uh, doing this in 5ZZX, Macarial uh, sitting on the undock of a station, and they they actually use two command destroyers where the one of them teleports the second te command destroyer on top mm -hmm. of the material but but what oh it's a teleport chain they teleport yes. it onto their wow so okay. so the so the first command destroyer activated his and then two seconds after that the second one activated his so it as soon as they teleported it, it immediately the second teleport activated so the spin up time is just internal to the ship. So you have right. a six second act activation time. Mm -hmm. So if you have it far away, you can basically just go, okay, I'm here, one, two, three, four, and two seconds after the first one starts, the other guy starts. So the Macario or anybody else who's trying to do a station game has no opportunity to go, oh, hey, there's a command destroyer. Mm -hmm. that so ins that's interesting. Yeah, he instantly has to click dock before they, like, as they land on him, or else he's just going to get teleported away, like, like this material did, and then he died. Like, it was, it was amazing to watch. That's going to be a huge incentive to avoid station games, which is good, because station games are dumb, mm -hmm. one. And two, uh, you know, people burning back to gates. I think that this is going to be sort of a sea change for people trying to use uh, blockade runners and things like that. Anything else, like, oops, I jumped into a gate camp, and now I need to go away, uh, as long as they aren't scrammed, you know, you can uh, bounce people off it to the point that uh, there's just no escape, uh, which is makes NullSec more dangerous, makes uh, 
which is always good. We're a big fan of that. Yeah. So, I mean, also from this patch, you also have uh, the Tech 2 Logi frags, which Tech 2 Logi frags are just finally showing up on the market. They take, I think, two days per log logistics frig to make, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of a long time, for, uh, especially for these Tech 2 frigs. And uh, one of the big controversial points about them is they actually aren't allowed into the small, the small complexes right now. Uh, so I was, I was reading through some stuff today, and people cannot take their Tech 2 logistics frigs into the small complexes, which are supposed to house uh, Tech 1, Tech 2, and uh, frigates and destroyers. So you can get, you, the command destroyers can go into the smalls, but the Tech 2 logic frigates can't. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. I, I mean, I, all I know about that is, you know, we're looking at it from a, the, the production of T2 Logi frigs is something that I think will strengthen the T3 destroyer doctrines that you're seeing. So like the Imperium is using a uh, jacked off fleet. You're seeing a lot of confessor fleets around mm -hmm. and about because uh, with all of these adjustments, uh, there's one thing that we've determined. It's that assault frigates are just kind of obsolete in this day and age, right? Like there's really rarely a reason to use an assault frigate when you have a T3D. And if you've got a T3D, do you want to have a Logi frigate with that? That or with an, an asteroid fleet? No. I mean, we ditched our assault frigate fleet in the Imperium. Um, so I think that that's going to be interesting. I'm excited mm -hmm. to see those there. I think that having you know more frigate logic all the way around is excellent. I love uh, frigate gameplay in general. Yeah. So I guess in the last last biggest thing I would consider in the new update would be the grid size is expanded. And the big thing about this as a as in fleet meta is there's no more grid grid manipulation. Because uh, a lot of times before a fight would happen, people can go into a grid and manipulate it where one side is completely gone, or where mm -hmm. you have to where you have to fight in a certain area. Or a fight gets tripped up where everybody is kiting, mm -hmm. and then suddenly half of your fleet disappears, and then logistics gets all screwed up. Like that's always been a weird aspect of Eve. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and, and that's so with the giant grid sizes, you can't really do that anymore. And uh, if you, I think G to four four, uh, the two stations on four four are actually on the same grid now. Uh, and then also in Dodixie, there's a POS within range of the uh, station, and uh, the guy who owns the POS was selling and naming rights to his POS as like an advertising board, which I found amazing. <laughs> like, it's, it's <laughs> That's excellent. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. You know, having, uh, you know, I, I like that all the way around. Like, it's always seems sort of unreal. I mean, it's, it's a very gamey mechanic, right? Of course, mm -hmm. this is limitations of, of how EVE was coded in 2003. Uh, so having, like, massive unbroken grids such that you're sort of, uh, you know, your uh, suspension of disbelief is not broken. I think that's excellent. Um, but also, another thing I just want to hit on this is not just the grid food. Like, from the, the Stork is fantastic. Right, the Stork is the sexiest ship. Mm -hmm. It has always been, and I don't know what this is. I actually, we should ask one of the CCB guys next time we have him on. Is like, is there a disconnect between the art department and the game design? Because like the Corax had the best hull, right, and the Stork is based mm -hmm. on the Corax hull. Um, but you know, the, the stats on the, the Corax was just never really very good. And you know, the Talwar looks like a, a nose hair clipper, like you know, one of those like little things <laughs> that you stick up your nose, a motorized nose hair trimmer. Uh, <laughs> Now that you've seen that, you'll never be able to see anything else. Uh, but it, it's really nice to see the stork in black and red. And I've always said that if CCB wants to make tons of money really rapidly, all they have to do is release the uh, Kalakiota, however the hell you say it, skin, such that everything can be skinned black and red, <laughs> just like the stork. But we're about the uh, half an hour mark here, Laz. So I think yep. we're going to do something a little bit differently this time around. We've typically done giveaways at the end, and what are we doing now, Laz? Well, for right now, I'm actually going to shout out Donald Trump again for his uh, next $10. Vote, vote in the Republican Party for me, and the Trump Nation will join Karma Fleet. The Trump Nation. <laughs> I'm not sure how I feel about that. I mean, I like the money. I love the money. Please give us more money. At any time, you are uh, feel free to donate and watch the cat fall off the table. Also, subscribe. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, shameless plugging. We're not going to make any bones about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not really sure about having Trump Nation inside of inside of Goonstorm and Karma Fleet. That would be uh, traumatic. I but think. But like other time just said, guys, we're going to shake things up today. We're going to do the giveaways right now. So we're going to do them in the middle of the show, guys. Go ahead and type in chat if you haven't already. Make sure you're following the stream. If you're not following the stream, you cannot win. Uh, we're giving, we have, or sorry, giving away three pirate rookie ships again today. So make sure you type in chat. I'll do the rolls here in, let's say, 30 seconds. And then immediately following that, we're going to be bringing in Sion Kumitomo. Uh, I think I said that right for the first time ever. Um, but if I didn't, know, whatever. <laughs> we, we don't like, <laughs> no one likes that guy anyway. So if you read his, his articles. I, I, I hear that guy's a jerk. <laughs> Okay. So, guys, like I said, type in chat. We're going to be giving, doing the giveaways in here, like I said, just a minute, and then we'll bring you on Cyan. Okay. All right. Oh, my God. There's so much text in chat now. I, I wonder why. I mean, I think that doing this is better because, like, doing giveaways at the tail end of things tends to leave us feeling rushed. So. Well, the big thing, the, the reason we wanted to change it, and I was talking to Cyan about this earlier this week, was uh, was we felt 
at the end of the show, like the people are like the guest is trying to talk, and we're trying to get as much into the show at the end, and then we have to, all right, got, we got to stop into the giveaway. So, oh so god, oh god, oh god, yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, so guys, doing the first roll right now. First winner is going to be Solil Foreigner, S O L E I L F O U R N I E R. So, message the channel, uh, let us know that you won, and uh, give us your in-game character name, and we'll make sure that gets to you. So, next winner is going to be Anna Nido Stephanie. I, I How, nailed, nailed, it. <laughs> nailed it! Nailed <laughs> it! And nice. And the last winner is uh, Happy Little Bee. Happy Little Bee. Happy Little Bees. Excellent. Well, congratulations, guys. Thank you to CCB for giving us these codes to give to you. We always love to make it rain on the boys. Uh, that is what we are here for at the end of the day. And uh, we got a new follower, new subs, and uh, more Donald Trump donations, so we really can't. <laughs> So, guys, coming up now is Cyan Kimi Tomo, Tomo uh, which I don't have a fancy graphic for him today. Uh, we're still working on that, and then whatever. Uh, <laughs> he, so Cyan should be connected in. Uh, can you hear us there, Cyan? Yeah, I can hear you guys. Sweet. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not the only one. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, well, I'm happy to be I'm here. In hell with you guys. Wow. Okay, excellent. <laughs> so, Cyan Kimi Tomo member of CSM 10 and do you remember what CSM 9 as well or how many years have you actually been on CSM so far this is my second yeah I'm so sorry yeah again me too <laughs> <laughs> so are you going to be going for a uh, for a third term then with, with this coming up I'm pretty convinced that I'm going to be solidly backing a Zanuria candidacy so I'm not sure that there's room for both of us okay you, I can't tell whether you're serious or not um and you might be. So, I mean, if Zanuria wants to run, I mean, and the people, the people, if the people want a Zanuria candidacy, who are we to deny them their desired representative? Actually, I'm pretty curious to see what people in chat say about that, whether we should throw our backing behind that. But I mean, why is that, Sion? I mean, one of the things, regardless of Zanuria, who I think would make a fantastic and very dedicated representative, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that, uh, besides opinion pieces and things that have raised some controversy, which we can talk about later, but uh, an actual data point that I noticed, uh, you tweeted that the CSM has not really had any, any interaction uh, to speak of with CCP since the previous summit, which was months ago. Um, what's the story there? What's going on? I wish I could tell you. I don't really know. Like, this CSM is functionally dead at the moment. Like, uh, we've got a lot of really good people in the CSM, and it's not the CSM's fault. And I'm not sure that I could point to any one person on CCP's side and say it's their fault either, but due to various systemic issues, CSM hasn't done anything since the summit for the most part. Uh, we haven't had any dev meetings. We don't have any dev meetings scheduled. Um, it, at this point, the bulk of the CSM is like, yeah, term's over. And I mean, they'll probably yell at me for speaking for the CSM, but I'd be, uh, I'd be curious to, um, like if you look at the recording that I think Shadow and Light did in uh, Vegas, when somebody in the crowd asked how many of you are running for CSM next year, Nobody at the table raised their hands. It's like, I think that says it all right there. Wow. Not a single returnee. That's interesting. So, I mean, when you say that the, the CSM is functionally dead, does that mean that you guys are not talking to each other? Or is that more of a reflection of a lack of communication with CCP? What does functionally dead mean? It means that there is no purpose being fulfilled by the CSM. So, uh, they took the idea that I uh, brought to them at the first summit and then they killed it, and they gutted out all the good parts of it, and like, hey, we'll just run our own focus groups, which have turned out to be disastrous. We and talked about that a little bit on the, the last meta show, how some of these focus groups, Laz was saying, have like 38 people on it. And the, the comment that I made then, which I'll, re, I'll reiterate now, is that you know when you have a focus group and you get to choose to listen to a cacophony of like 40 different people, and you say, I pick that guy, and I'm listening to his feedback, um, that's not really... I mean, that's, that's not a focus group. 40 people, that's an unfocused group. Uh, what has the CSM's opinion of the focus groups been, and what have you been seeing about that, Sion? Well, Hold this on. is... I, I'm going to cut you off because we just got another donation. $20 okay. from Donald Trump. Hi, Hold Dan. On. I'm Donald XOXO on Craigslist, ready for some fun what-fuck-wrong window. So, Donald, Donald's a, 
uh, casual encounters. Uh, remember. Uh, Donald, you got to like hide Donald. your grinder account, dude. Donald Trump is <laughs> at least our Donald Trump on the Matai.com is the best, and we really appreciate all the support that the Donald. We should start now. Remember, he has now donated enough to us that we should show him proper respect. We're not going to call him Donald Trump anymore. We're going to refer to him as the Donald because Donald. we're classy like that. So <laughs> many thanks to the Donald. And now, Sion, back to you about uh, the focus group situation. So one of the reasons that in my original proposal that the CSM was supposed to run the focus groups is a matter of time and a matter of accountability. As I think you said last week, when you have 38 people, developers can just listen to whoever they want because it will inevitably back up whatever they want to hear. Um, it doesn't have any kind of accountability to differing opinions. Mm -hmm. Plus, there's the time sink of managing the focus group themselves. Every bit of every minute that they spend managing these focus groups and being like, hey, we're going to do this, is time that they're not spending actually developing. And more importantly, you have direct feedback, right? So it's not a case of, oh, the CSM is ignoring my feedback on this focus group. It is literally CCP interfacing directly with their customer base being, yeah, we botched this focus group and totally ignored you guys. And that's all on us. Like, it's direct CCP burning... Uh, really their most passionate players interest in it, and that's not a great thing. Hmm. Yeah, I know I know with the focus group, uh, like I was saying with the capital group, is I think 38 people was, or, or, are currently in it, uh, and the biggest thing about it was I think CCP's way to get around the whole, like, not letting CSM run it was, oh, if CSM, you can all join too, because CSM was all invited to be inside this focus group. They can all join. Oh, if there's message, I think, Larrick in to get invited to it. So it, it's... I, yeah, see, that's part of the problem. Like, there's certain elements in CCP that are quite happy to marginalize the CSM at every available opportunity. So when they saw, hey, there's a focus group, and now we can totally ignore the CSM, run our own things, and just not talk to the CSM, have no meetings, or whatever else. I, it, that's what I mean when I say that it's functionally, the term is over. Well, that was a, uh, a thing that Fozzie, uh, CCP and Fozzie had tweeted sort of caused a minor PR scandal that they tried to, you know, walk away from, I guess, was, uh, I guess it was a month and a half, maybe two months ago, some, he replied uh, to a tweet basically saying, you know, don't bother talking to the CSM, find your own representatives or things like that. Uh, you know, certainly this CSM, and this was reflected in the minutes, and you insisted that this was reflected in the minutes that... I read at the start of the last summit that the CSM uh, 10 had been absolutely accurate in their predictions about player response and feedback to the implementation of the FozzySoft system and that these, uh, this feedback had been ignored and that all of the unhappiness from the player base that came from it uh, was preventable had uh, the involved parties actually listened to the CSM for the feedback, the accurate feedback which it provided. But, you know, my personal theory about this is that there's a lot of people who don't like to accept criticism, right? Like you have to sometimes like, everybody has to accept that they screw up, right? And you have to go, okay, this is wrong. Or we tried to do this thing. Like with the TMC website redesign, perfect mm -hmm. example. In March of this year, we thought that we had a good design and blah, blah, blah. And it was implemented terribly and our people hated it, right? And we had to go, okay, we screwed this up. Now let's go through this long process of doing this. And the most important step is they were, you know, we were developing something for people and we didn't actually ask people whether they wanted it or not. And like with Fozzie saw, we kind of saw the same thing. We're like, we're right, we're going to develop this product, we're going to do it, and we're not actually going to talk to our customers. When we do talk to them, we're going to ignore what they have to say. Uh, and it was all preventable. But some people can't handle that and they want to shy away from the reality uh, of, you know, screwing up. Everybody screws up, you got to face it. I think it when, goes deeper than that though. Really? Like it's not, yeah. Like you made a really important point as you said, customers. but Internally in CCP, I almost never hear it referred to as customers. It's always really referred to as players. And there's a really, really big step. Yeah, like it's a step between players, and you can be like, oh, players are whining, players are unhappy, players are upset, players are, you know, you can just fill it in whatever you want. And it distances yourself or themselves, I guess, from saying, you know what, we're actually building a product for consumption here. We're responsible for delivering something that people want. And it's way easier to dismiss that if you're like players as opposed to customers because you're accountable to customers and you can dismiss players. So in other words, they're not, they're not assigning a monetary value to their player base. I don't know if it's a monetary value. I think it's, like I said, it's, it's an accountability chain. Be like, hey, we have 
customers who are paying for a service that we are responsible towards, as opposed to, hey, we have a bunch of entitled players who are playing our game, our game, and our train set. You know, it's a, it's a totally different mindset. Like, it's subtle, but it's really important. That's really kind of interesting all the way around because we've seen that before is that people will dismiss criticism as being just, oh, filthy casuals or things like that. Uh, and, you know, the, the danger of it is, um, you know, we've seen the danger of ignoring players, of, you know, whining players is that it pushes people away from looking at the numbers, right? The numbers are everything, the numbers, the metrics, the deliverables. So when you implement an expansion or when you're doing something with an EVE and you see that customers are going away from your product, they're not logging into your product, they're not engaging with your product, uh, then that's something that needs to be dealt with immediately, as opposed to what we saw happen was this long and slow and sort of bitter process. Now, what's good about this new expansion, if we are seeing more sand in the sandbox and we are getting promises towards changes to capitals and citadels that features that people are excited with, um, but it, it, it's curious, back in the day, and when I say this, I mean in the era of uh, John Lander, uh, CCB Unifex being the executive producer of you online, uh, you saw sort of a radical engagement in the post-Incarna era. After Incarna, you know, we had, uh, I, I believe the Incursion expansion was after Incarna, but I'm not sure about that, I forget at the moment. Uh, but Retribution, all of these really fantastic expansions that were added uh, after, you know, talking to the, to the customers and saying, what do you want? Oh, you want more ships? Well, here are new destroyers. Oh, you want all of these new things? Here you go. Um, and I would like to see a return to that, and hopefully with the addition of the Command Destroyers, this whole period of la 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 la, we can't hear you, you're really going to enjoy this Fozzysoft stuff, and wait, why did you all stop logging in? Uh, you know, hopefully they can turn that around. What do you think is the path forward, Scion? It's going to take a lot of work on their end to reorganize whatever their corporate culture is. There's a lot of really great individuals there, like there are, there's lots of really just wonderful people. But somewhere in there is something that allows them, be it structural or be it certain individuals who can block it, like I don't have the answer there. But they have to get beyond this ridiculous insecurity and dismissiveness of players as players as opposed to people who are paying them for a service. Mm -hmm. And if they can't get past that and be like, you know what, maybe we should look for more feedback, maybe we should utilize the tools we have. Like That's the real issue that I have with the usage of the CSM is that there's a huge potential in the CSM for them to have a really great pathway to uh, sourcing the wisdom of crowds, which is not easy to do. Like if you try to build this from scratch, it'd be tough. But the implementation and the tools aren't that much different than the CSM as it exists now. We see this with like um, Sugar Kyle and Corbex, who are both fantastic CSMs, but are not structurally supported in what they do and not institutionally supported in what they do. And that's a shame. And they're, uh, it's a that like that's I think is the starting point. I'm probably going to publish my entire proposal that I gave to them back in August, hmm. which will be fun because you can see a bunch of my predictions came true, and, and I always enjoy that. But that was, we'll see. Like I, I think that's the only path forward here because I don't think that they have the ability to execute anything no. else. Well, then a question from chat. Uh, it's a little a little bit off topic, but uh, Bethel asks, any opinions on the latest Aura mishap? Has there ever been a games company more disaster prone when it comes to people and gaming their finances? Because um, I know they had the way back in or it was a year ago, two years ago, and they had the Amazon mishap where you get three plex for five dollars. Um, is he, is he talking about the RM mishap, meaning the fact that you could buy uh, an Explorer pack for like a dollar on Steam or Green Man Gaming? Right. And, that's, okay. that's what exactly what he's talking about. Like just, just stuff like that. Because I know I know the Amazon thing was Amazon's mess up, not CCP's. Uh, and then they also had another, I think, another another Amazon mess up with the Orem recently. And then now we have the Green Man Gaming and Steam. Was thing. that actually a mess up or was that just a sale? Uh, the the one I think the one t the recently was just a sale. I know the, okay. the two Amazon ones were, were on Amazon's part. Were, were yeah, well, mistakes. I mean, you know, if CCB wants to have a sale for things, then that's great. I mean, that's awesome. If they want to get people using RM and looking at skins, that's just a promotion. So, I mean, those packs are normally five dollars, and they reduce the price to a little bit more than a buck. Mm -hmm. Um, and I I didn't actually see anything about that being uh, a problem. What I am curious about, and one of the things I do want to hit on this that we did see in chat is um, 
there's a difference between listening to your customers and what they say and listening to actions. This is an inflammatory thing when Hilmar said it a long time ago during the Incarna crisis where he said we will listen to actions and not words and people got all pissed about that. But there is a difference between customer behavior and you know customer action. So if we're all saying we hate Fazisov but we're engaging more, we're killing more and the, the bottom line is going up, we might be saying we don't like it but our behavior seems to show that we do like it. Uh, so you know I don't think that people should just listen uncritically to what customers say. That would be madness. But, you know, I think that there does need to be a focus on, uh, you know, you have to accept data. You have to accept the reality on the ground uh, and look at what people are doing to judge success or failure. Uh, anyway, Sion, back to you. Uh, well, and I think, I think, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think that's important. Like when, when I say things like sourcing the wisdom of crowds, what I'm to get more and sort of unpack that a little bit, I don't mean listen to everyone. Like that's madness. The reality is not everyone is worth listening to. Some people have really terrible ideas. Very true. But collectively speaking, if you take one individual person who is extremely intelligent, there is no way that they will come up with a better solution than 10,000 people who are all collaborating in sort of the same direction. Like you just won't. You won't have as, as uh, good of a solution. But that takes organization, right? Like You can't have some sort of crowd mob tossed together and just expect them to come up with something. It takes actual hands-on management filtering and then um, parsing all of that feedback and that's again that's what the CSM would be great for because you get past all of the kind of toxic uh, minority loud voices who don't represent a ma majority opinion who don't represent uh, how people actually uh, play the game or who may not even play the game you like you have to have a way to filter all this stuff but ultimately speaking when you're in a game like Eve where you're have huge, complex, ridiculously complex social structures, a single developer or a developer team will never be able to outthink these players, these customers. Like, it's not possible. One of the things about this is uh, that is interesting to me is when people are trying to, like, there's a quote that came from the EVE Online uh, forums that I've never seen before, and maybe somebody else has heard of this before, but it was fantastic because when you ever see a, a mob, a major, like a big focus group or an unfocused group, or just people like raging out, uh, claiming to speak for the majority and like listen to our voice or things like that is, um, what was it? It was, um, it's easy to speak for the silent majority because they rarely object when you put words in their mouths. And I was just like, oh my God, that's amazing. Because you have lots of people running around saying, you need to listen to me because I'm loud and things are on fire and I set them on fire and here's my idiotic idea. And everybody behind me believes me, but they just don't have the courage to speak. And you see a lot of that these days. And it, it's just hooey. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, call me crazy, but I really like to have a proven track record behind people. Like it's really easy to toss rocks at people. But if people are just sitting at the sidelines throwing stones, without offering solutions, they're not putting themselves out there. They're not putting themselves, they don't stand for anything, they just stand against everything. And that's stupid. One of the things that's curious about this is I, I think it's sort of a broader commentary on modern internet culture. And it's something that I really don't like. Uh, one of the, but it's intriguing, it's like an Achilles heel. So you will have these mobs, right? You saw that with sort of Gamergate, you see it in the behavior of certain toxic subreddits, uh, you see it in general with just people, tor torches and pitchforks, is once people get enough uh, energy and rage going, they think that that means something. And they think that it means that people will buckle before them or will change their minds. So you recently wrote an incredibly controversial column, which was not really all that controversial. It is simply stating the reality as it is. It might have been a little bit inflammatory, but whatever. Uh, and the fact that people were so furious with you, I think, was a reflection of uh, the idea and entitlement to you are supposed to feel ashamed and that you are supposed to not have the conviction behind what you said and that because there are a bunch of people who disagreed with you that said that the silent majority is against you and blah, 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 that you are then supposed to be cowed. And I don't think that internet mobs in this day and age are used to having people say you are wrong and it doesn't matter whether you go after us, you're still wrong and we don't care. Because so many corporations and entities, I mean, you've seen it with gaming companies a million times, will just buckle uh, when people grab the torches and pitchforks. Um, you've seen it with CCP. They buckle at stupid stuff like this, too. And this is the interesting part that I don't think, like, it's not, you don't see it. Like, you see a couple voices, and if you look at it, it's like 10 people or whatever, just being like, oh, I'm really super offended by saying that. 
uh, the things that I said. But I get way more private support on the down low. Be like, hey, thanks for saying those things that I couldn't say. I don't want to have the hate mob chasing me down, but I'm glad that somebody is saying this. Like you mm -hmm. said exactly the way I feel. And uh, I just I don't have the ambition or the energy or the ability to stand up to these people because I'll just you, know, you can see how they're treating me, right? It's just endless comments about how awful I am, which you know, I find might it, be true, but still, I, I find it energizing. I mean, I think that you know we did we did we see that in a lot of controversy actually is is that people uh, you know the internet is not really a uh, well understood place like society it goes across borders, uh, it is anonymous. Uh, people can and have set uh, all sorts of just crazy harassment stuff. Like, look at what happened with Zoe Quinn. In fact, people tried to bring her into this controversy uh, a couple weeks ago, which is just bullshit. Um, and it takes a lot, I think, to get out there and say, you know what, you're wrong. I don't care, right? It, it doesn't matter whether you cry and say that what I wrote is... Uh, you know, bad and I should feel bad and just go away. I stand behind my convictions and our purpose. Uh, and I don't think that there's a lot of that on the internet. And I think that there needs to be more of that. No, there isn't. And this is, and the interesting thing here is like, I'm not actually saying anything new. Like Nosy Gamer did an entire, uh, well, at least two blog posts about how awful our Eve is. Uh, Kagali, uh, another CSM member, did an entire segment at Eve Down Under about how he would direct people to the amazing community of EVE Online, they'd see Reddit and flee in terror. Yeah. So it's like, it's not, like when you can look at something and objectively say, hey, this is something that is bad because of these reasons. I'm not saying this because I have anything, like any agenda to grind. It's mm -hmm. just bad because it is bad and you can uh, try to shout me down. doesn't make you right. The louder you get, whatever. doesn't matter to me. So... Uh, I think it's interesting to me, though, or, or the most interesting part about all of this is um, when you look at the actual feedback behind it, now you've got people like Crossing Zebras jumping on board, too, and be like, you know what? We are now comfortable talking about how toxic our Eve is. We are now willing to talk about this as well. And I think that if nothing else, if I can kick off a, a discussion about that sort of toxicity by a small minority of vocal players, then it's worth the abuse. Well, one of the things that we've seen about it that is curious is that even as those people think that they are succeeding, in terms of the metrics, they're killing themselves. Like, they are destroying the metrics of their community, is what they're calling it, right? They are destroying all of that, right? So in November, traffic into RE, which is the example we're using, went down by 25%, right? And the entire time in November was one long toxic Gurgoons, Gurmatani, Gurscion, mm -hmm. all of it, right? And it is self-destructive, right? They are destroying that community, which is actually probably a good thing. They're calling it a community, whatever you want to do. However yeah, I, you call want. It, I call it a platform. Like, I think a community requires some sort of shared interest. And if you look at it, like, there's never been an R Eve meet. Like, most of the people tossing most of the bombs have never shown up at a real-life event. That's a really good point. You don't actually see the most vocal RE people are not at Vegas. They're not at FanFest. They're not actually interacting with people face to face. That's a really curious thing. I'd be curious to to take a look and see, you know, why they're afraid to meet people. What well, would you like you, you call you call Reddit uh, the RE a platform? Uh, it originally, I guess the the big shouting box would be Kugu. I mean, would you consider Kugu the same thing and once Kugu shut no. down all that all that left? See, here's the difference between something like Kugu and even Fail Heap Challenge and Reddit is, and this is the article that Crossing Zebras really outlined well, is that in a forum architecture, you can still see dissent. You don't just see only what you want to see and only what the prevailing people who go there and vote want you to see. Like, you have a possibility of a discussion, and there's a history there, too. It's not just a, hey, we're going to form up a whole bunch of things, change our flair randomly, and uh, you actually have your name associated with your history. So you can post things, and you post things, and that's part of your posting history. That's part of, uh, builds up your credentials there. It's not like, oh, well, I just changed my, uh, my flair, so now I'll get different votes, or I changed to another throwaway account to get more karma. Like, it's just, it's so disingenuous as to be a farce. They're not the same. Fail Heap Challenge, I would, there's actually the shit posting thread on Fail Heap Challenge is really good compared to anything on our Eve. It's kind of amazing. Yeah, the thing about it that's curious to me, like from a psychological perspective, is I think that the sheer amount of uh, anger 
from the most toxic people on Reddit, or at least on that particular RVF community, is because there's this frame of democratic entitlement, right? Like on when we have forum warfare on goonfleet.com, it's plus rep and neg rep, right? But on Reddit, in particular, you are voting up and down. And so if you're from a democratic country, you're steeped in this democratic tradition and there's an expectation that we won this vote and thus reality should be impacted by us winning a vote. And then when the reality is not actually impacted, it sort of turns into this toxic spiral of ever increasing rage. So again, you have these situations. A perfect example is we have this charity situation where uh, Goon Swarm and the Imperium goes and participates in the EOC Rumble, just like every other mm -hmm. blog has for all these events. And we are compared to the ISIS of EVE. Right, the level of discourse, and this gets upvoted because they think that it's going to be excellent and wonderful and it's going to change our feelings and they're going to get rid of us. Then, even though we donate to this charity, probably the largest single group of people donating to it in the first place and participated just as anybody else, at the end of it, there is a real scandal. There is a real scandal involving a charitable funds that was done as part of the community that is being diverted. And there's no torches and pitchforks. There's nothing because it doesn't matter to them. All that matters is the attempt to hurt certain people in the community by evoking this democratic frame and upvoting us away. Unfortunately, just like with the Fountain War, that doesn't really work. Yeah, but it's a platform. That's all it is. It's not a community. The interesting thing about it, though, is that communities have come from it. Like, Test is a community. Brave certainly as Karma Fleet. Karma Fleet is Accord. definitely a community, yeah. You like have people these... who meet up and they hang out with each other and they are actually interacting with one another yeah. and looking out for each other. As the, interesting to... thing, the interesting part about that, or the most interesting thing about that for me is all of them say the same thing, right? They say, our Eve is a toxic cesspool. We try to pull away from that and create our community elsewhere. Well, <laughs> so the blame for telling. that is on the moderators. I mean, the fact of the matter yeah. is, is that there are good subreddits across all of Reddit, some of which are very useful. Uh, you know, it is ultimately the, I mean, one of the things that's really hilarious is there's this huge controversy in our Eve about a year ago where they tore into each other, so that, I guess nine months ago, because they were going to try to ban telling people to kill themselves because making suicide jokes is inappropriate, but they, I mean, you know, you should not be making suicide jokes. I did that when I was drunk off my ass. It was a terrible mistake, which I regret deeply. Uh, quite ashamed about that, and I don't do that anymore because you fuck up and you have to learn from it. Uh, and here, are, you know, Reddit, our Eve is being used as a platform to try to, uh, you know, throw sanctimony and be self-righteous. And nine months ago, there was this controversy where they're saying, uh, you know, one of the moderators tried to clean up. One of the mods said, we should stop allowing people, and this is, you know, 2015 or late 2014, we shouldn't have people making suicide jokes on our Eve. And there's a huge controversy. And many of the people who are now trying to uh, go after Scion, like, uh, you know, those people were posting in that thread raging about their free speech and their need as representatives of the Eve community to tell people on that to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, and they changed it. They actually went back on that and said that it is that no, 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 we're not going to tell people not to do that. And, you know, so the moderators, the one moderator tried to fix it and then uh, he broke under pressure. And so now that's what it is. So if we want to talk about fault, if we want to talk about blame, when we're talking about the toxicity about it, is the blame is obvious where the blame should be. It's a few individuals who are in charge of that that could take action that don't. Uh, because they well, are essentially spineless hypocrites. And I'm going to have to cut you off there. Guys, we're actually out of time. It's coming up here in about 60 seconds. It's going to be the boat show. Thank you so much, Simon Kumitomo, for coming on to the show today, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Show Actually, before I close things up, I have to shout out the blue microphones. Indeed, indeed. Yes. Can't really see yours, but you can see mine. Actually, no, you can't. You can. see mine, yeah. You have your camera on Skype is pointed at a different place. That's I'm good. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'll get blue microphones, and we have our support from Razor oh, as well as our support yeah. from CCP. Thank you guys so much for allowing us to make it rain on the boys with our pirate faction code giveaways. And uh, do we have the boat show coming up next? Yeah, boat show coming up next, guys. And now everyone angry posting in chat why short the show is too short. I'm sorry, guys, but boat show coming up. Make sure you stay tuned, the and after show. that will be the undead the boat zone. Show. So you guys Excellent. have a good good Saturday. We'll see you later. Cheers. World's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts.
Right here, if you have a beard, random men are going to always walk up to you and try to lick your beard. Ew, that's so <laughs> disgusting. Oh, oh. <laughs> You're one of Ben's kittens. Hold on, Fox. 